Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Bart Mitchell, President and CEO of the Community Builders. The Community Builders is the leading organization in the country dedicated to neighborhood revitalization and mixed income housing, managing almost 10,000 apartments on 100 properties throughout the eastern half of the United States. Bart has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Bart, for joining us today. Glad to be here. So let's talk about urban environments. Why is an organization like the Community Builders important to urban environments in the eastern United States, in fact, throughout the country? Cities have tremendous infrastructure. Cities have uh, the growing part of our population. In the 21st century, it's expected that cities are really the places that populations are going to grow. So they are at their best, diverse places, interesting places. But sometimes there's neighborhoods that need some dedicated rebuilding. And sometimes there's neighborhoods that are going to be, have tremendous opportunity where moderate income people are going to be priced out unless there's some conscious effort. But why can't the market just, just do what the market does? There are so many people who say we are a free market economy. Let the market be what it is. If people are priced out, they'll move to other neighborhoods. It's, it's, it's sad, but it's, it's sort of the way things work. Why is that bad for cities, and why is that bad for the citizens of the cities? Well, first of all, we're a private organization. We compete with for-profit and non-profit private organizations to do real estate development. But uh, we tend to use a mixture of private resources and public resources to accomplish uh, development projects that have a spillover benefit for the neighborhood. It may be that each individual homeowner is making a rational decision not to invest their sole livelihood in a tough neighborhood. But if there was rebuilding of streets, if there was some solid apartment community next door, some mixed income housing community, some home ownership that has been started, the neighborhood has intrinsic benefits of access to transportation, access to downtown, access to jobs, actually a greener form of living than living in some place that needs much more of a car. Uh, but someone has to go first, and often there's been tremendous public investment in highways and things that bring people out of the city, and very modest investments in the city can strengthen the neighborhoods. How are community voices uh, heard in this process? Because no matter how difficult a neighborhood is, it is still somebody's neighborhood. So when you come in and you are engaging in a project like this, there are going to be people who oppose these projects for very good and personal reasons. There are also going to be people who support these, these projects. How do people who um, generally have no clout in the political process, uh, no economic clout, how are their voices um, heard in, in your projects? That will differ somewhat, my answer, for the last 15 years and the next five, 10, 15 years for us. It, for the last 15 years, we were many times entering a new location. And so it was hard to read the answer to the question you're asking, which are the community voices. But we usually came by invitation. Usually the local government, some branch of local government, or local neighborhood leaders, or local elected officials said, we need some transformation of scale, right. which is going to have a spillover benefit. And we need one of the organizations who have proven they can do this elsewhere and asked us to come to town. But then we had to meet everybody because What's the right density of housing? What's the right mix of home ownership and rental? Uh, what's the right housing forms? What's the right pace of development? Uh, what are the adjacencies to deal with? And who are the community leaders? And uh, what are the ways of communicating with regular community residents? Do you work on, on things like uh, services and supportive housing services and those kinds of things for those people who might otherwise be, um, be uh, disenfranchised and dislocated from the, the neighborhoods in which they have lived? Uh, our name is the Community Builders and one of the things we hope distinguishes us is in addition to working on high quality housing solutions, mm -hmm. we have both a very strong neighborhood focus and a very strong resident focus. The neighborhood focus may lead us to say, gee, we don't usually build grocery stores but this neighborhood needs a grocery store. So at 47th and Cottage Grove on the south side of Chicago, we're developing a six-story mixed-use building with a grocery store. There's a tremendous interest on our part in making sure that housing is a platform of opportunity 
for the lower and moderate income residents of the mixed income housing. So we work tremendously to see that the best daycare that's available in the area is available very nearby. Often we'll make space and let somebody locate it on site so families can get to work. So you're, you're working with uh, local community groups that might be running daycare centers or that might be providing uh, other services to the community. You might be uh, working with local merchants um, or, or even people from outside the community that would like to uh, site a grocery store in, in a particular community in order to develop a comprehensive series of solutions. Yes, yes, and yes. And what's going to be easier for us uh, in the next 5, 10, 15 years is we're really focused on doing more in the places where we are. So we had about 800 apartments in Cincinnati, and we just purchased another 800 that were very troubled, difficult buildings uh, that were blight on the community. And a number of local community groups came together to do strengthening of schools, working with the police, cleaning up of vacant lots. But they wanted a larger organization to come in and partner with them to take over these 37 troubled buildings spread over three neighborhoods that we've now undertaken. And you become the landlord of, those, of these buildings? Yes. So you, you invest in the buildings, you bring them up to a, a, a higher standard, and then you, you uh, fill them with tenants, and then you become the, the, uh, the managing agent for those, uh, those properties. We do, and as, as a result, we also think of ourselves as a major stakeholder in the neighborhood. And all of our employees think in a time frame of decades, not just what's going to happen in the next week, which is extremely important, but how are we going to develop relationships that can build upon themselves and build strength over time. Now, all this costs money. How do you fund your, your individual projects? And then how do you also fund your infrastructure? Very often, organizations that run projects um, can get funding for the projects, but it's very difficult to uh, get funding for the infrastructure required to manage across projects. So let's talk a little bit about the project funding first, and then let's talk about how you fund the organization as a whole. They're, they're quite related because starting about 30 years ago, there was a decision in the country that the best way to develop how mixed income housing was for private organizations to do it. And now this was, this was on the heels of that very bad experience where we tried to do this as, as a central government planning function in New York, Chicago, Boston, and other places. So we had already had at that point 20, 30 years of trying to create government-based uh, solutions. Correct. So this was the next chapter, next experiment, was to say, what if private groups do it? What if they have to take tremendous risk? What if they have to provide very large financial guarantees? What if we let for-profit and non-profit developers compete with each other? Uh, the amount of resources required will be private resources and some public resources if you're going to offer some of the apartments at below market rent or below market sales prices. Right. Uh, but there needs to be enough money to pay the, pay the builder, pay the architect, and pay some kind of risk premium to the developer. In return, we give 15 years of guarantees to financial investors uh, and often 30 or 40 year compliance guarantees to state and city government that the housing will not only be made available to people of appropriate income, but, for, but well maintained. So is each project a self-funding unit? Each project is a self-funding unit and has a small developer fee risk premium in it, which uh, we can retain to run the organization. But in return, we're making promises and financial guarantees that last decades. Now, these projects are put together with different constituents. So t talk about the, the people who are part of this, this agreement and, and part of sort of your, your network of, of vendors, builders, contractors, and so on. It takes a tremendous uh, team to do any of this. So the usual professionals that are involved in real estate development, engineers, architects, land planners, builders, we often have a high focus on seeing that the design and construction effort will benefit the broader local community. We make sure we're using minority business enterprises and women in business enterprises, hiring local people, getting involved early that there's training programs so some very local folks may be able to get a step up into the construction trades that way. And there's nothing much to distinguish these folks, the project managers, the builders, the local businesses, from people who are working on a purely commercial, no social good element um, uh, project. It's, it, the competencies are all the same, um, 
perhaps there are more complicated outcomes. In fact, perhaps the competencies of the team uh, need to be higher in order to make it all work. The competencies are all the regular competencies and then the financial requirements to understand how to meet some of these um, job opportunity requirements and financial compliance makes some of the lawyers and financial special specialists uh, ones who have really learned these programs, but the architects and the builders usually are just very strong architects and builders for housing. And is the, f is the financing all done via uh, loans and, and government-backed securities and so on and so forth? How, how does that work? Usually it's a mixture of debt that the rents can support, and the form of federal support is a tax credit. So corporations uh, decide that they uh, would like to purchase the tax credit and they'll pay almost as much as they would have in taxes, but a, a small risk premium that they'll save a little bit. Uh, we get the funds instead of them going straight to the treasury to build the housing. Now you were previously the CFO and the COO of this organization, then you took a, a bit of a break and then you came back to the organization. So that expertise is is central to uh, to any leader of such an organization because it's a financially driven organization you are basically a builder manager financier banker deal maker contract manager and so on and the most of our people are the property management people we have 500 employees over 300 work at the sites work on extremely interesting issues day to day in the, the natural life of a community. Um, so all of the issues related to training and uh, hiring the right people and retaining them and giving them a great career paths are huge to us. And how do you fund the, the central organization, central administration piece? Is that, is that done through the risk premium that's built into every project or do you have other sources of funding? It's uh, largely done through the risk premium that's built into every project. Uh, we actually early on mastered some of the financial complexities. Mm -hmm. So we will put together the investors for the funds rather than using intermediaries by themselves to do that. Sometimes we can retain that premium as well uh, to pay for the work. And then uh, we own mixing up apartments. So the market rate apartments can produce cash flow on a recurring basis year after year. Do you find that your projects have a um, significant impact on the economic well-being of, of cities? In addition to very strong market economies like in Boston or just out of side of New York City in Yonkers or in Chicago, we are also working in places like East Chicago, Indiana, which is a steel town where it has just a fraction of the workers that it used to have, where we've been working for uh, close to a decade now and literally with the local leadership and rebuilding the center of state and Maine that they're creating new density and new parks in the middle of downtown, first with housing, uh, and now we're getting the best uh, rents and home prices in the entire city, right in the center of downtown, and now looking to get the uh, motor vehicles to move back to right to the center of downtown, the post office to move from the edge back to the center of downtown. But we also work places like Lincoln, Massachusetts, and Martha's Vineyard, and very expensive communities where there is a commitment to have some mix of incomes, some ability for local firefighters and police workers and teachers to have a chance to stay in town. And we're often building the one of only or one of a few mixed income communities in those towns. And by creating magnets in the center, you're reducing all sorts of different costs. You're reducing uh, commuting uh, costs, fuel costs for, for gasoline, people who are moving back and forth. You are also reducing risk because as you're as you spread, there, there is risk that is associated with uh, siding a business in a place where your customers might not be. I'd agree with those things. We're a nonprofit organization. There's probably two uh, big mission benefits to what we bring. One is we can get involved in the neighborhoods you described mm -hmm. earlier than a for-profit actor because we don't require the rate of return. Right. And so we'll take a higher risk relative to the rate of return being involved early. So who are your shareholders that you're bringing shareholder value to? Is it the local community? We hope. We hope it is to the local community. In terms of, of your hiring, you must require a lot of local knowledge, but you need local knowledge in, in 100 different places. Um, how does that work? How do you find the right people to join uh, your organization, or if not join your organization, to be partners with your organization as you, as you pursue these projects? 
It's an exciting time for us because now that we do have a presence in each of these places and we're looking to go deeper in Ohio, go deeper in Virginia, and go deeper in the Northeast and these other 14 states where we currently work, we have people there. So we have some folks that are development people that are based in D.C., Boston, or Chicago that need to work on a broad geographic area. But in most of our cities, we have local people, dozens of them, that are working every day, that are really thinking about what's the na next neighborhood we should be working on or the extra thing we could be working on in the neighborhood we already are. And the important thing is that this is not a, uh, an issue that, that is at all involved with, with the political process. It doesn't matter if you're conservative or liberal or progressive or any of the other names. It's, it, it's really about the communities and about the results and about the practicality of achieving solutions. That's our proposition. Uh, yet every local elected official has a lot of responsibility to make decisions about what's going to work in their neighborhood. So they need to decide whether what we're offering is going to be a positive. Often they're tremendously interested whether the mixed income feature is really going to work. That if it's the strongest uh, economy neighborhood or the strongest economy suburb and they are going to make an effort to have some affordable housing or mixed income housing, they want to make sure we're really going to be good at the market rate portion and not just the quality housing for people of modest incomes. Often it's people in the poorest neighborhoods that are most anxious to make sure we're really going to succeed at the market rate portion because they want uh, us as an earlier actor to, uh, to, to bring over spillover benefits. You mentioned earlier about who our shareholders are and yes the communities but the other we want it to be our residents that uh, unlike a for-profit corporation if there is a net available from the activities we take. We are funding our own community life investments in trying to see, it, we've taken six of our largest sites as our beta sites and see what we can do to make housing a platform of opportunity that really moves the needle for the striving adults on increasing their income and better educational outcomes for their kids. And people have pride of place so they take care of that place. They have an investment and you have, if not ownership, you have the equivalent of, of understanding that you're not going to be thrown out uh, because all of a sudden your, your property is, is worth more and, and a landlord's going to try and figure out how to get you out as quickly as possible in order to, uh, to uh, achieve their own financial objective. Um, so you, you're basically creating a much more stable, invested uh, um, uh, community. I know that I um, benefited tremendously from growing up in a neighborhood where not only my parents cared about my achievement, but all the neighbors did too. And living in a community that's full of opportunity and hopefulness and very high expectations helps every kid in the neighborhood. So what's next for the community builders? We are very optimistic about what we're going to be able to do going forward. We're going to be working primarily in our existing geography of the Northeast and Midwest and the Mid-Atlantic, adding a few states, Maryland and Michigan or two, for example, that we're just starting in for the first time. We are going to be building housing and focus very much on mixed income housing, but also when the neighborhood needs it to look at mixed use development that might include medical offices, daycare centers, grocery stores, either by us or queuing things up for others to do. And we're very focused on our community life efforts for residents that can really help them move the needle on getting the best access to the public education and charter school educations in the area and having the adults increase their income. Bart Mitchell, thank you so much for sharing your experience with us and thank you for your insights. Thanks for your time.